Welcome, everybody. Bienvenue, bienvenidos a D&D Optimized, <laughs> part of the D4 network. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons. We theorycraft about them, we crunch numbers, not necessarily to tell you the right way or the only way to play a certain character build, but to explore one potential option in hopes of creating something that is both very powerful uh, in game, but also a lot of fun to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game, or if you're just looking for tips or tricks for a specific character that you are hoping to build, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I am really happy to have you here, so thanks for coming. Uh, my name's Colby, and I'll be your host. Before we jump in to the episode this week, just a quick reminder, if you enjoy these videos and you would like to have a written step-by-step -step guide to this and all of my other builds, uh, please consider joining the channel, if you would, as a member. Um, there should be a little button down there. For only $2 a month, you get access to like my library of write-ups, which I try to create for each episode, so you can have a level-by-level -level guide to recreate the character yourself, if you would like. More importantly, I think it's a great way to support the channel and help me create more and better content, so thank you. And even if you decide not to join, thank you for being here anyway, for liking, for subscribing, and just watching the video. That's also helpful, and I appreciate Appreciate it. You guys, we're about to hit 30,000 subscribers, and I kind of can't believe that. Thank you. And stay tuned for an exciting announcement that I'm going to release as soon as we hit 30,000 subscribers, which might be later today, about what I'm going to do to celebrate that milestone. It's really exciting. I kind of am having a hard time containing myself. So, anyway, be on the lookout for that. All right, as for the build this week, you may have noticed that I don't do a ton of artificer builds on this channel, or at least I haven't thus far. That's partly for a couple of reasons, I think. One, there are only four artificer subclasses in the game, much fewer than any other class. But it's also partly, if I'm being honest, because I think, generally speaking, that Artificers tend to be one of the weaker subclasses in D&D, brace for impact from angry Artificer fans. If you disagree, that's totally fine. Feel free to tell me why I'm wrong in the comments. Now, I'm not saying that Artificers are worthless. I'm not saying that you can't make a very viable and even powerful Artificer character. I've done so a handful of times. In fact, my one of my most popular videos ever is the Armorer uh, Artificer tank build that I did several months ago that I love and who, well, for those of you who are League of Legends fans or fans of the recent Netflix show Arcane, neither of which are sponsors, yet, you might particularly appreciate that build if you haven't seen it because I think of it basically as Vi from that game and show. And by the way, if you have not watched Arcane, seriously, you're doing yourself a disservice. You've got to check it out. It's like my favorite show of 2021. It's right up there with Ted Lasso, though completely different, of course, for me. Even if you don't know anything about League of Legends, you absolutely should check out Arcane. Okay, free plug finished. But anyway, I, I have done other artificers as well. The the Mounted Battlesmith, which was a lot of fun. Um, okay, fine, I'll link to that. And I even used an alchemist in my combat medic build right there. That's three. Okay, I'm going through cards quick as usual. But the one artificer subclass that I have yet to touch in any build ever, and barely even considered, frankly, for that matter, is the Artillerist. That also happens to be one of the subclasses that I've been getting requests for ever since I started this channel. And so that is what we're going to do today. Now, here's the thing about the Artillerist. To me, when I look at their suite of abilities, what seems the most sort of unique and fun thing to try and build an artillerist around is their ability that they have to do some decent sustained multi-target damage. Sustainable, i.e., you know, usable every single turn with out a lot of resource expenditure. Multi-target damage is pretty rare and unique. You don't see a lot of it in D&D, 5th edition anyway. 
most things that do damage to multiple targets come in the form of limited use abilities, primarily spells, but also things like the Dragonborn's Breath Attack or the Ascendant Dragon Monk's Dragon Breath Attack. I'm sensing a theme here. But racial or class abilities that are usable a number of times per short rest or per long rest, etc. To date, I've only actually ever done one multiple target sustained damage build before, the Death Cleric, and that's my fourth card for the day. We're almost done. I'm not going to rehash here the argument that I've made in the past about the tactical wisdom of going for multi-target damage versus single target damage. Suffice to say that sometimes you want the ability to do damage to multiple targets at the same time, and when when you do, it's nice to have the option. Not only that, but doing damage to a lot of enemies at the same time is just straight up fun, I think. And if you can do it every single turn in a variety of ways without spending a lot of resources to do it, I think it's even more fun and potentially even more valuable. And so that's how we're going to be building our artillerist today as a sustained damage but multi-target damage character build. I'm really excited to share it with you. And so that's the end of my preamble. Let's jump in to episode 70, The Artillerist Artificer. All right, at level one for our class, yes, I am actually going to start with Artificer. So we are going to be multi-classing as usual. Not always. I don't always multi-class. I just usually do. But I wanted to start with Artificer because they do get proficiency in their constitution saving throws, and starting with constitution saving throw proficiency on a spellcaster is fantastic, as we will plan on concentrating on a spell pretty much all of the time. So yes, when we first meet our character, they are probably a bit of a tinker. They love to create things, not necessarily just with their hands, though I think that's likely part of it, but they have an uncanny ability to build and make things infused with both their own ingenuity and a little bit of the arcane as well. As for our race, I am going to recommend custom lineage. I don't see this as super important, but getting a free feat at level one here will give us an edge numbers wise, tactic tactics wise, especially in the early game. If you really want to go another route, like a rock gnome or something, because they're just the bee's knees for tinkers or any other race for that matter, you know, feel free do what you want to do. But as for the free feat that I want to pick up here at level one, initially, I really wanted to take telekinetic because it's a half feat, but can potentially help us better position our enemies for area of effect damage, multi-target damage, right? The problem is trying to telekinetically shove an enemy with this feat requires a bonus action. And as an artillerist, our bonus action is basically gonna be spoken for every turn as we'll get into a little bit later. And so taking this feat just added a conflict right from the get-go that I didn't want to have to deal with. I'm going to opt instead for a different half feat. I'm going to recommend Fey Touched. This is one of my favorite feats from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. It gives us a plus one to, for us, of course, intelligence. And then we learn the Misty Step spell, which is a great like bonus action. You can teleport 30 feet spell. And then one other first level spell of our choice, but it has to be from the enchantment or divination schools. The spell that I think I would recommend here would be Bane, actually. And surprisingly, I've never used Bane in a build before. It's basically like the anti-bless, right? You pick three targets, and if they fail a charisma save, which almost all enemies in D&D that you're gonna run into probably will fail against our respectable difficulty check. They have to subtract a D4 from any attack roll or saving throw that they make so long as you maintain concentration. The great thing about this is that for us, for this build that I'm going for here, 100% of the sustained damage anyway that I plan on doing with this character is going to be saving throw based. So increasing our plus to hit as we would via the bless spell doesn't really do a lot for us, at least not from a sustained damage perspective, but, but decreasing an enemy's saving throw does wonders. Not to mention, of course, the survivability bump that you and your friends will get by reducing your enemy's chance to hit you. Now, the great thing, of course, about Fey Touched is that we can use the Misty Step and Bane here once per day for free without spending a spell slot, and thereafter we can use our spell slots if we would like. And I think we probably will, especially for Bane, at least at the early levels. Later on, we're going to get a different spell that we'll plan on using for a concentration, but for the first five levels or so, uh, I think this will be our go-to. 
As for our abilities, I'm assuming as always that we're using the point by method and recommend starting with a 15 intelligence and then we take our plus two there from custom lineage as well as the plus one from the feet. So we get to start with an 18 intelligence, which is fabulous. And then 14 for constitution, a 14 for dexterity and a 12 for wisdom. Equipment, I'm gonna recommend going the gold buy route because if we went the equipment route, we would not get to start with a shield, which feels odd because artificers are proficient in shields. So let's go gold buy, get some scale mail armor, get a shield and some tools of your choice, probably woodcarver tools, your other necessities, of course. And then at level one, as an artificer, we get the magical tinkering feature. This is mostly for flavor and utility, but basically we can do fun things like make a mundane object shed light, or make a noise, or have a visual effect, stuff like that. And then of course we get spells. We get only two cantrips for now, as well as some first level spells. So for the cantrips, I'm gonna strongly recommend that we take Acid Splash, and mending. Acid Splash lets you, with an action, force two creatures, if they're within five feet of each other, to make a dexterity save or they each take 1d6 acid damage. Uh, one important thing to note here is we're told that we have to have a spell casting focus, which for us is our tools, in hand whenever we cast artificer spells, meaning that all of our spells have a material component inherent with them. This is actually a good thing for us as we'll see later, but just keep it in mind. And I don't anticipate any conflict here because we're not planning on using a weapon. So we've got a shield in one hand, our tools in, our, in the other, and we should be free to cast whatever spells we need to. Since the hand that's holding the material component can also double for the somatic component if we're casting a spell with a somatic component. Mending is handy. We're gonna want it later on for repair purposes. And as for first level spells, I would just say pick your favorites. Cure wounds feels like a no brainer to me, but whatever else you think looks good, go for it. We're not planning on using any of them for our sustained area of effect damage. At level two, artificers get infusions. I love infusions. They are a lot of fun. Basically, you're taking a mundane object and you're turning it into something magical. They can be really powerful for defense, offense, or utility. But to be honest, this build isn't actually super dependent on any infusion for damage purposes. And that's actually kind of nice in a way, because it really sort of frees you up to use whichever infusions you like, or even potentially give one to an ally. So at this level, we actually get four infusions known for now, which we can swap out whenever we gain a level in Artificer, uh, but for now we can only have two of them active at, at any one time. And no one item can hold more than one of our infusions at a time. We can also swap out what item we've got infused after a long rest. If it were me here, I think I'd probably pick up Enhanced Defense and put it on my shield for a plus one to our armor class, and then Mind Sharpener, putting it on our armor, which lets us 1d4 times per day use a reaction to succeed on a concentration check that we failed. That's really nice, and with our Constitution saving throw proficiency, that means we'll very rarely be failing a concentration check. At level three, we get the right tool for the job, which tells us that with an hour of work, we can magically create a set of artisan's tools. Cool. And then, of course, artificers get their subclass, their, their artificer specialist. And we are taking artillerist, as we've mentioned. So here's what we read about the artillerist. An artillerist specializes in using magic to hurl energy, projectiles, and explosions on a battlefield. This destructive power is valued by armies in the wars on many different worlds. And when war passes, some members of this specialization seek to build a more peaceful world by using their powers to fight the resurgence of strife. The world-hopping gnome artificer Vi has been especially vocal about making things right. It's about time we fixed things instead of blowing them all to hell. <laughs> Sounds fun. So we do get some additional spells as an artillerist. We get shield and thunder wave. Very nice, both for defensive purposes and to have another area of effect option. But then of course we get the eldritch cannon feature. And this is sort of the defining feature for artillerists, right? It's what we're really building around. With the eldritch cannon, once per long rest or with a spell slot, as an action, man, you work fast. Within six seconds, you create a, an Eldritch Cannon. <laughs> it can be small or tiny. Um, if it's tiny, you can hold it in your hand, which is cool, but we're not going to plan on doing that. 
Now, you can only have one at a time, unfortunately, at least until we were an Artificer level 15. It is a magical object. It has decent durability stats, an 18 armor class, and then five times your Artificer level in hit points. It heals for 2d6 if you cast Mending on it, which is why we took that cantrip. But, and this makes me really sad, actually, it only lasts for an hour. I wish that it functioned like other sort of pets do in D&D, &D, right? And, and just sort of endured until they were killed, for the most part. I mean, it's not like artillerists are overpowered. Come on, Blizzard! I mean, come on, wizards! Anyway, you determine its appearance, and if it has legs, which I strongly recommend, because who doesn't want legs? Even mermaids want legs. But then, on our turn, as a bonus action, we can make it walk, if it has legs, <laughs> or climb, and then we can make it activate. Now, what it does when it activates is going to depend on what type of cannon you created. And you have three choices. The Force Ballista makes a ranged spell attack using your ability modifiers, and if it hits, it does 1d8 damage and moves a creature five feet away from it. There's some potential coolness here. Forced movement is always nice, especially with this, as there's no save or even size restriction, right? It just moves them if it hits them. I opted not to build around the Force Ballista here, but I can see some fun stuff with pushing a target into like a spell effect or something, etc. The protector option is a pretty nice little source of recurring temporary hit points. Each creature of your choice within 10 feet gets 1d8 temporary hit points plus your intelligence modifier every single round on your bonus action. That's really quite good. And again, I can see a lot of usefulness here for like a tank or support type character or frankly even for a damage focused build who also wants to throw out some really great support this is arguably the most powerful form of your eldritch cannon and you should definitely make use of it sometimes i think when you need to but we're not going to focus on that instead we're going to focus on the flamethrower option the flamethrower eldritch cannon spouts fire in a 15 foot cone requiring each creature in its radius to make a dexterity saving throw or take 2d8 damage or half on a save so a nice little like burning hands-esque effect every round as a bonus action without needing a spell slot or even your concentration that's pretty great it's not a ton of damage but perhaps if we could combine it with other area of effect damage options it would stack quite nicely at level four at this point in our character's career they are becoming increasingly interested i think in the arcane aspect of their skill set what exactly is the nature of the thing that is powering their creations it's not just science right it's more than that it's a power, in fact, that might have additional applications beyond just giving life to otherwise mundane objects. They want to know more about it, and they're willing to spend a little more of their time and brain power pursuing that knowledge. So whatever your reasons, we're taking some wizard levels now, and I love multi-classing wizards with artificers because they are the only two cl official classes in D&D that are intelligence based where intelligence is their primary stat right and so there's just a lot of fantastic synergies here that we don't have to be multiple ability score dependent to enjoy and so as a wizard level one we get the arcane recovery feature uh, once per day after a short rest we can recover a spell slot equal to half of your wizard level rounded up and speaking of spell slots and rounding up keep in mind that unlike other half casters in dungeons and dragons paladins, rangers, when you are calculating your spell slots based on your multi-classing, you take half of your artificer levels rounded up. That means right now we would have we would basically have the spell slots of a full third level caster or four first level spell slots and two second level spell slots even though we don't have any second level spells yet. And so that's good to know for upcasting purposes. And yes, we do, as a wizard level one, get some additional spells now here. There are a lot of great options, many for area of effect potential, right? Sword burst, burning hands, especially, I think, for us, as we'll mention later, ice knife. For cantrips, I'm just going to recommend that we pick up Toll the Dead here. It's 
a better damage option for us right now if we can't get two enemies in our acid splash it does 1d12 damage to an enemy so long as they're not at full health and and they shouldn't be at full health because you can use your bonus action before your action there's no reason why you couldn't so go ahead and turret first and then you'd toll the dead if that's what you were doing the other nice benefit to uh, toll the dead is that it's a wisdom save as opposed to a dexterity save and most enemies on average are going to have a harder time making a wisdom save than a deck save anyway as for first level spells we really need to make sure that we take find familiar <sighs> familiars are the best we're not really going to be using them much in combat just yet hold tight but you can still use them to scout you can see and hear through their eyes and ears if you incapacitate yourself to do so and they can take an action on their turn without using any of your resources to direct them which is very important and we get to choose what form they take and normally i recommend an owl for the flyby feature right this time i'm gonna say go ahead and take a hawk i still want to fly but i'm sick of owls in their creepy little swiveling exorcist heads. The hawk, I think, is is better here for their greater flying speed. They get 60 feet of flying speed movement, which just might help you keep them a little bit safer. At level 5, we would be a wizard too, and wizards get their arcane tradition, their subclass. I actually considered several options for the subclass here. Um, Chronergy and Graviturgy were both strong options, I think. The reality is I don't actually consider it super important to the build, whichever way you decide to go here. So I think there's a little bit of flexibility here, to be honest. But for me, I think Evocation makes the most sense for this build due to our focus on area of effect damage. And then there actually is another nice little benefit from evocation that we will get but not until much later for now we get the sculpt spells feature which tells us that when you cast an evocation spell that affects others you can see you can choose a number of them equal to one plus the spells level and those creatures automatically succeed at their saving throw against the spell and then take zero damage when they succeed on their saving throw if succeeding on the saving throw would have caused them to take half now we're not going to get a lot out of this feature from a sustained damage standpoint but it definitely will be nice to have when we decide to spend some of our spell slots for some burst area of effect damage like if we wanted to use bur the burning hands spell or thunder wave with our action for a little extra area of effect oomph once in a while right now we could do this without worrying too much about which allies we might hit meaning we'll usually be able to position it in a way to hit one or maybe even two more enemies than we otherwise would have been able to do, so keep it in mind. Also, don't forget that as a level 5 character now, our Acid Splash scales up to 2d6 per enemy that it hits. At level 6, we would be a wizard level 3, and we get second level wizard spells. There are a lot of great ones. Shatter, of course. Web, of course. But the only one that I'm going to say that we really need to make sure we get for this build is Dragon's Breath. So with Dragon's Breath as an action, we touch a creature, giving them the ability, so long as they have a mouth, to breathe fire or lightning or cold or poison or acid as an action in a 15 foot cone just like our eldritch cannon all creatures in the blast zone have to make a deck save or they're going to take 3d6 damage here and half on a save so guess who has a mouth <laughs> our hawk familiar has a mouth don't you dare try to tell me that a beak does not qualify here and guess who can take an action on their own turn without using any of our resources to do so so long as they're just not taking the attack action that's right, hockey does. And so guess who is now going to be flying back and forth, raining down death and destruction like the teeny adorable dragon wannabe that she is. Yep, hockey again. You should probably name your familiar Drago or something. This is actually something that people have been asking me to do for a long time to sort of use the familiar, use the find familiar spell in an offensive way with spell casting, not just to take the help action, right? And so I'm really happy to find a fantastic way to work it into a build right now. So yes, this is a great little trick that we can now have our hawk familiar, so long as we maintain concentration on the dragon breath spell, be doing area of effect damage without us needing to use our action or bonus action otherwise. But 
we need to remember a couple of things here. One, our familiar is incredibly fragile. If your DM likes to target your pets, and especially your familiars, this might not be the best build for you. That said, because it can fly and has 60 feet of flying speed, it should be able to keep itself relatively safe from most of your enemies. Hopefully it can even take cover behind you or you know some other battlefield obstruction with 60 feet of fly speed. Also, if an enemy does spend its turn attacking your familiar, it's not the worst thing in the world. Even if they do manage to kill it, it's going to mean one less attack on you and your allies, and you and your allies cannot be resummoned quite so easily if you die. Now, yes, of course, it would be a second level spell wasted had you, you know, put the Dragon's Breath spell on them. So it's something to consider, but it's not the worst thing in the world. Definitely discuss with your DM your plans and try to get a feel for how much danger you can anticipate your familiar being in on a regular basis before you fully commit to this build, I think. The other thing to consider that I want to make a point about is we want to understand the area of effect here. Cones are three-dimensional shapes, are they not? So they spread, right, 15 feet from the point at which they're cast, meaning that at the end of the range, the shape is three squares across, 15 feet across. But it's not just three feet across, it's also three feet up and down. Again, three dimensions. So if you were to cast a cone directly above the battlefield, at the point that it hit the ground, it would be a three by three square, well, circle technically, but on the grid, it would, it would affect a three by three area, right? So we now have two good reasons to make sure we get a flying familiar here. One, to help them stay safe, but two, to give us a bigger area of effect for our 15-foot Dragon's Breath cone attack. Now, unfortunately, Dragon's Breath is a transmutation spell, not an evocation spell, so you would not be able to sculpt it. But still, the decent size area and the decent damage that we get from it is pretty nice, especially considering that as long as we maintain concentration on it and our familiar stays alive, we can just continue to enjoy that area of effect damage round after round. Oh, and one more thing, we do get third level spell slots here, thanks to multiclassing, which means that we could upcast Dragon's Breath if we wanted to, to do 4d6 per affected enemy per round. So at this point, I really consider the core of the build fairly complete. And now that it is complete, I wanted to pause for a moment before our first damage report and show you guys the fantastic art for this character concept by Randall Hampton, my friend. I didn't want to show it before because it would kind of give a little bit of spoiler as to what I was going to end up doing with this character. I love this piece by Randall. I think it's my favorite that he's done so far. I really enjoy his vision of the custom lineage concept that looks really drow-like. If you want to follow Randall, as always, check out the video description for links on how to do so, and thanks for the fantastic artwork, Randall. And then listen to this amazing description of this character concept, written up for me by the sponsor of this week's video, Describe. They took custom lineage and envisioned it kind of as a gnome, which I think is totally appropriate. Here's what they wrote. Manic laughter accompanies the thumping, thunderous boom of the gnome's eldritch cannon, spewing death and fire from its red-hot barrel. The flames light their mirrored goggle lenses with an almost alien glow, as in one gloved hand the gnome conjures a ball of caustic, green fluid and hurls it into the midst of their foes. From overhead, a screech signals the arrival of the gnome's familiar as the owl dives, releasing a line of flame across the battlefield in a distinctly dragon-like strafing attack. The smoke roils, the laughter rings out. <laughs> Oh, that's so good. I talked to you guys about Describe a few weeks ago, and I love them just as much now as I did then. For those who don't know, Describe is a fantastic online tool that basically recreates awesome, well-written like box text that you get in official D&D adventures, which usually just describe a setting or sometimes an important character, right? If you've ever wished that you could have more of that high-quality descriptive writing for your own campaigns, whether official Wizards content or homebrew, and whether a setting or an NPC or even as a player for your own character or important weapon or awesome spell that you cast or attack that you make, well, with Describe, 
you can. Anyone who wants to can sign up for a free account and get access to a huge portion of their library of thousands of scenes, characters, spells, items, actions, and more. But the best part about them, in my opinion, is that if you become a subscriber at the hero level, you can submit requests yourself for anything that you want a professional writer to describe for you. That's exactly what I did for the artillerist that I created for the build this week. What I just read is what I got back from the Describe team, which is filled with professional writers, some of whom actually even used to work for Wizards of the Coast themselves. It's a fantastic tool to use both, I think, while you're planning your session or your character, or to just have open at your fingertips while you're playing or DMing. You know, maybe you assumed that your players would go to the Noble's Manor, but instead they decide to explore the slums. You didn't have much prepared for the slums, but a quick search in Describe will quickly help you flesh out scenes and even characters that will make it feel and sound as though you had. Or Maybe you just used a new spell for the very first time and your DM asks you to tell everyone what using that spell looks like. Do a quick search and you'll likely find something awesome to really help everyone at the table visualize the spell and feel more immersed in the world and the story that you're creating together. Do yourself a favor, check them out, sign up for a free account if you haven't at the very least, and please consider a paid subscription if you like what you find there. When you do go there, please be sure to use this link so that they know that you heard about them from me. It's describe.com slash d4. Um, I'll put a link in the video description, but again, that's describe.com slash d4. And also, if you do decide to buy a subscription, use the code d4 at checkout and you'll get 10% off. So thanks to everybody at Describe, and let's get back to the damage report. So at level six, our first damage report, here's what our tactics look like. I'm going to assume that we have our Eldritch Cannon and our Familiar up before combat begins. Obviously that won't always be the case, but if it is on round one, we would cast Dragon's Breath on our Familiar and have our Cannon make its flamethrower attack for 2d8 fire damage per target. And then Hockey would then use Dragon's Breath on their turn from up above as a third level spell for 4d6 damage per target. And then on subsequent turns, we'd simply use our action for the Acid Splash Cantrip for an additional 2d6 damage per target, assuming, of course, that we can hit two targets that they're standing next to each other. It's kind of funny how our action here is actually the lowest damage of everything that we're doing. But in a way, I actually kind of like that. It means that if we needed to, we could do other things like dash or dodge or help or even bring up a downed ally with cure wounds and not suffer too much from a sustained damage perspective. And of course, we could always use our action for a bigger, better spell, whether burning hands, scorching ray for single target, right? Shatter, etc. I just wanted to use cantrips because again, I'm going for sustainable damage here, which means low resource use. When appropriate, you should absolutely use more spell slots for whatever you deem best. Just remember that our concentration is spoken for, so if you wanted to use web or something else, that's fine. It's a great spell, right? We just won't have hockey living their best dragon life. Anyway, assuming that we're just hitting two targets per turn with all of that, which I think is a pretty safe assumption here. I mean, sure, you're not always going to get two targets with Acid Splash because they have to be right next to each other, but a three by three sphere for Dragon Breath makes me think that you'll be just as likely to hit three with that as as to only hit one assuming that there are multiple targets on the battlefield to begin with anyway anyway that would be 8d6 from dragon's breath plus 4d6 from acid splash for 12d6 total plus 4d8 total from your cannon and so against enemies with a plus zero to their dexterity saving throw we would on average do 49 damage per round here and against enemies with a plus two to their save, it would be 45 DPR. And you know what? I'm kind of surprised at how good that is. <laughs> now, granted, it is versus two targets, so it might not be tactically superior in every situation, as opposed to single target focus, right? But still, that's a lot of damage for a level six character to be doing on every single round with the only expenditure being a single third level spell slot. It puts us in upper tier one territory compared to other sustained damage builds that I've done to date. And yes, in case you don't know, check out the video description where I put graphs and spreadsheets for this character and compare them.
them to other sustained damage characters I've done. And yes, I am going to try to get a video out very soon where I re-rank all of these and break them down into three tiers instead of two because it's too crowded for two. Thanks for your patience. Anyway, let's see if we can keep this reign of multi-target destruction going. At level seven, I think it's time to go back to Artillerist for a while. Our, our character has scratched the itch for a minute, satisfied some of their curiosity about these arcane forces. They want to get back to their creations a little bit more. There are some really nice Artificer benefits for us right around the corner here. So at Artificer 4, we would get our first ability score increase or feat, and I think bumping intelligence here is a no-brainer, as all of the saving throws that our enemies are going to be making are going to be based on our intelligence enhanced difficulty checks, uh, even the non-spell Eldritch Cannon damage. So yes, having an intelligence capped at level 20 feels great. At level 8, we would be an Artificer 5, and we get second level Artificer spells here. There aren't a ton that wizards don't already get. Aid and Heat Metal are two of the standouts, so I would say try to pick those up. But then we also get the Arcane Firearm feature as a level five artillerist. And this is an interesting little feature. We can now turn a rod, staff, or wand into an arcane firearm. <laughs> is this like the spellcaster's equivalent of a gun blade? But this will serve as a spellcasting focus for our spells. Whenever we cast an artificer spell through it, and remember, as we mentioned at the beginning, all of our artificer spells have a material component, right? So all artificer spells should be cast through this firearm now. When you do, you roll a d8 and gain a bonus to one of the spell's damage rolls equal to the number rolled. Now, in case you were unaware, as per the rules in 5e, when you cast a spell that does damage to multiple enemies, you roll damage once and apply it to all creatures affected. This is another reason why, to me, the Artillerist seems to be really built for multi enemy damage above all else, because now we would get to add a d8 to all of the affected targets whenever we cast a spell through our arcane firearm. So that 2d6 acid splash cantrip just became a 2d6 plus 1d8 cantrip, potentially, to two targets. And of course the bigger and more powerful spells, your thunder waves, your shatters, will receive the same benefit. Now, what about dragon's breath? Unfortunately, Dragon's Breath is not an Artificer spell, so no, we would not get that benefit here. At level 9, we would be an Artificer 6. We get tool expertise, which means that we that our proficiency bonus is doubled when we use a tool that we are proficient in. The only time I can really see that coming into play very often is if you are trying to like disarm a trap or pick a lock with your thieves tools or something. Maybe you've got a great story where you used your gem cutters tools to great effect because of your doubled proficiency bonus. I don't know. And then do keep in mind that as an artificer at level six, we now have six infusions known and we get to have up to three infused items. I think my favorite new item here would be the spell refueling ring, which we couldn't get until we were level six artificer. And it lets us recover an expended third level spell slot or lower once per day, which is funny because Artificers don't even have third level spell slots at Artificer 6 unless they multiclassed. It's almost like wizards knew. But between this and Arcane Recovery, we've got a lot of spell slots to be able to burn in a day, which is awesome. I would probably also here swap Enhanced Defense for Repulsion Shield, which still gives you the plus one to AC, but now has the added benefit of 1d4 times per day. You can push a melee attacker who hits you up to 15 feet away with your reaction. That's especially nice for us as we're so concerned about positioning our enemies just right so we can hit as many as possible with our multi-target abilities and spells. And keep in mind that the up to here is very important. If it's better that they only go 5 feet or 10 feet, you can do that. Alright, so for our level 9 damage report, not a lot has changed for us tactically, and not a lot has changed for us number-wise either, unfortunately. We've gained more spell slots and defensive capabilities, but the only damage bumps have come from an increase to our intelligence and our proficiency bonus, plus an extra d8 for our artificer spells, which is only going to be for our cantrip here. It's too bad the Eldritch Cannon doesn't benefit from that, but uh, using your Eldritch Cannon is very much not casting an artificer spell, so regardless. Against 
enemies with a plus zero to their deck save, we would be doing now 60 DPR on average, and against enemies with a plus three to their saves, it would be 53 damage per round. So our damage has started to plateau just a little bit here. We still got a decent little bump compared to other sustained DPR builds now, we're more like at kind of the lower end of the tier one builds, but hey, that's still not too shabby. And of course, we could always throw out some decent single or multi-target burst if we wanted, or again, even a nice web spell or something if we are okay to forego some damage in the name of control. At level 10, we would be an Artificer 7, and we get the Flash of Genius ability, which tells us that intelligence modifier times per day, when you or another creature within 30 feet make an ability check or a saving throw, you can use your reaction to add your intelligence modifier to the roll. Okay, not too bad. It's too bad that you can't also use this to like reduce an enemy roll or something, or at least wait until after the roll to decide if we want to use it, but at least we get to do it five times per day for us, which is a pretty nice little feature. We also now have fourth level spell slots if we wanted to upcast Dragon's Breath. At level 11, we would be an Artificer 8, and we get another ability score increase or feat. With our intelligence capped, I think we should probably turn our eye toward defense and or utility here. I'm going to suggest taking Resilient Wisdom here as a feat, both because A, Wisdom is an important saving throw for us, and so this would now let us add our proficiency bonus to our Wisdom saving throws, which is really great, but also because it's a half feat, it gives us a plus one to our Wisdom score, bringing it to 13, and we're going to want that later. Spoiler alert. As a level 11 character, also remember that our cantrip scale here, so Acid Splash is going to go to 3d6, which is a nice little bump. At level 12, we would be an Artificer 9. I wanted to get at least this far in Artificer because we get the Explosive Cannon feature, which gives our cannon an extra d8 of damage. So it now does 3d8 in a cone instead of 2d8. We can also, puzzlingly, cause the cannon to detonate if we wanted, but it requires our action it makes the cannon explode so you don't have it anymore, causing every creature within 20 feet to make a deck save or take 3d8 damage, which is as much damage as it does normally when you activate it. That's like the worst explosion ever. I guess that once in a great while it might be worth it because the enemies are resistant or immune to fire damage and this is force damage, or maybe there are like a ton of really weak enemies but they're super spread out over a big area or something. But yeah, sometimes you just get abilities that are real head scratchers. This is one of them. But the bump to damage from 2d8 to 3d8 is nice and we'll take it. Uh, we also do get third level artificer spells here. I'm just gonna say pick your favorites. There are some good ones. Catnap, Dispel Magic, Revivify. None that I'll plan on using to improve our sustained damage per round. Now, you do get Fireball as an artillerist and that seems really fitting for this archetype, right? Of a character who's just bombarding. And it's not a terrible use of a spell slot, I don't think. Coupled with our cannon area damage and hockey's area damage, it would really let us throw out some pretty nice burst area of effect damage when we needed to. And since Fireball is an evocation spell, we would likely hit a lot of targets with it and keep our friends safe at the same time. It re remember, it just has to be an ev evocation spell. It does not have to be a wizard spell to benefit from the sculpt spells feature. And because it's an artificer spell, we would get to cast it through our arcane firearm and let us add another d8 of damage on top of all those dice that we're going to be rolling with the fireball. At level 13, it might be time to leave Artificer behind. Now, you might disagree, and that's okay. There are some really nice things about higher Artificer levels. More and better infusions, including some really cool magic items that you could make. The spell storing item is really nice as well. In the end though, I am trying to make this character for as much sustained area damage as I can, and there's, there's really not anything in the Artificer path from here on that would increase our area of effect sustained damage per round by very much outside of Artificer at level 15, which would at that point then let us create two turrets instead of one, and that is amazing and would be a big damage bump, but it is six levels away 
we wouldn't get there until character level 18 at this point, and there's virtually no damage increase in sight between now and then. Even though we would pick up a lot of cool utility and defensive stuff by more artificer levels, the damage really plateaus pretty hard until much later. And this kind of gets back to the little rant that I went on during my Drake Warden build, which I won't repeat here except to say that it's sometimes really frustrating the way most classes and subclasses plateau so severely at higher levels damage-wise. So yes, if you would just rather live your best artificer life, and especially if you think that the game is going to go until level 18, go ahead and stick with artificer, no regrets. I'm gonna go back to wizard here for a few reasons. So yes, we would be a wizard level four now. And first up, we get level five spell slot. So one of the main reasons that I'd go back to wizard is for spell slot progression. As a full caster, wizard levels are just going to get us those higher level spell slots a lot more quickly than staying with Artificer would have. And with Dragon's Breath now being our biggest source of sustained area of effect damage, the higher we can upcast it, the better for this build. So now we would have fifth level spell slots, meaning that Dragon's Breath would do 66 damage if we chose to burn a fifth level spell slot for it. We also would get, as a wizard for, another ability score increase or feat. And this is rare for me, but I don't have a super strong recommendation for the ability score increase or feat here. Or at least, that is, there aren't really any feats that are going to do a lot for our damage at this point. I'd be tempted to take Elemental Adept to overcome fire resistance, but the only problem is that only affects our spells, and so wouldn't technically apply to our flamethrower. And we could just change the damage type for our Dragon's Breath every time we cast it if fire resistance or fire immunity were a problem. So it's pretty, it would be a pretty lackluster feat for us. Thus, I think I would just recommend taking another utility or defensive minded feat here, or ability score bump, right? If it were me, I think I'd probably either just bump my constitution or maybe take the tough feat for additional hit points. Or I might even go with the new Gift of the Metallic Dragon feat from Fizban's Treasury of Dragons. That would let us cast Cure Wounds once per day without spending a spell slot, that's nice, but then more importantly for us, it would let us as a reaction grant a bonus to an ally's armor class equal to your proficiency bonus if they're within five feet of you. And you can do it proficiency bonus times per day. So that means five times per day we could, as a reaction, give an ally a plus five to their AC. The main concern that I have at this point in the game and really throughout this character's career, I suppose, is the survivability of my familiar. And if this would help them stay alive, it would be a good thing. And so, Time for a damage report at level 13. Again, our tactics remain largely the same, but we have seen bumps across the board since last we checked. Our cannon damage has increased, our dragon's breath damage has increased, and even our cantrip damage has increased. So against enemies with a plus zero to their dexterity saving throws, we would do 89 DPR on average against two enemies, right? And against enemies with a plus four to their saving throws, it would be 76 damage per round on average. So we're still hanging out in like the middle to bottom half of the tier one builds. And I'm not gonna lie, we're keeping up better than I would have thought. At level 14, we would be a wizard five and we get third level wizard spells. Another reason why I wanted to go back to wizard was just for the better spell list. We, we don't actually have anything here that I would plan on using to increase our sustained damage per round, but having access to counter spell, fear, hypnotic pattern, tiny hut, etc. It just really felt like the better option for improved utility and versatility to me than sticking with Artificer did. At level 15, we would be a wizard 6. And this is the other main reason, the third and final, I suppose, main reason why I wanted to go back to wizard, because at level 6, as an evocation wizard, we get potent cantrip. And for a sustained damage build that relied a lot on our cantrips for damage, it's a nice little damage bump. So now, even when an enemy succeeds on a saving throw against our cantrip, they still take half damage. And that's a pretty unique and nice little bump for our asset splash here. And then we do get six level spell slots now, so our Dragon's Breath could potentially do up to 7d6 per enemy. At level 16, with potent cantrip and third level wizard spells secure, 
there's actually just one more little thing that I would like to do to bump our sustained damage just a smidge higher. I don't know why your character would make this slight little shift here. Perhaps you're just so battle hardened at this point or jaded by all of the death that you've seen that for a brief moment you lose yourself and you get a little dark. You're, you're painting a skull and crossbones on your Eldritch Cannon. <laughs> And, and getting a matching tattoo on your shoulder. You are embracing death for some reason because yes, we're taking a single level of death cleric here. And this is why we wanted to get our wisdom to 13 so many levels ago. I don't see this as imperative to the build. That's what we're doing. So anyway, as a cleric at level one, we get some spells. There's lots of great first level cleric spells and cantrips. I'm just gonna say, pick your favorite. And we're not using any here that we don't already have for sustained damage purposes. Then at level one, clerics get to choose their subclass. We'd go death cleric, like I said, and death clerics get the reaper feature. And it's pretty fantastic. It's just perfect for someone like us who's trying to do sustained damage to multiple targets per turn. So with reaper, our necrotic cantrips will actually hit a second target if those targets are within five feet of each other, like acid splash already gives us, right? But guess which cantrip is a necrotic cantrip? Yep the dead and we could have and should have taken that when we got wizard levels so now just like with acid splash we can hit two targets with our cantrip damage but the damage for toll the dead is almost double acid splash uh, hitting for 3d12 each target instead of 3d6 that's an average of 19 and a half per target on average instead of 10 and a half on failed saves right again with toll the dead having the better saving throw i was tempted to take this earlier actually but there's one little downside and it's that toll the dead is not an artificer spell we could it's a wizard spell for us so we can still use our intelligence for the difficulty check, but I couldn't think of a way to make this an artificer spell. If you can, feel free to comment about it. But that would mean that we would not get the extra 1d8 damage from our arcane firearm. But at this point, the difference in damage from acid splash plus a d8 versus toll the dead is about a d8's worth more damage from toll the dead. And it's a about to get even bigger because at level 17 our cantrip damage scales for the third and final time meaning acid splash would be 4d6 plus 1d8 and toll the dead will be 4d12 it's just a lot more damage so now i think at this point it's worth it to take that cleric dip but anyway at level 17 i say we go back to wizard we could stick with cleric if we really wanted to get their channel divinity feature i think i would prefer to be a wizard 7 and have fourth level wizard spells personally there's a lot of great ones again pick your favorites but it'd be you know banishment dimension door faithful hound greater invisibility polymorph of course wall of fire etc etc none that we would use for our sustained damage but lots of good options and then at level 17 remember like i just said told the dead that we're using is going to go up to 4d12 and we would have seventh level spell slots now so hockey could be doing up to 8d6 per target when they're breathing on them and so for our final damage report then the only thing that's changed tactically is that we're casting told the dead instead of acid splash meaning that we're hitting each target for 4d12, assuming that we can get two that are standing next to each other. And enemies now take half damage from our cantrips, even if they succeed on their saving throw, which is great. Our cannon is still doing 3d8 damage on our bonus action, and our little hockey is now making bombing runs for 8d6 damage per enemy if we wanted to burn our 7th level spell slot for Dragon's Breath. As always, I'm not saying that we should necessarily. I'm just exploring what's possible here, mes amis. Assuming we hit two targets with all of the above, that would be a total of 16d6 plus 6d8 plus 8d12 damage. And so against enemies with plus zero to their saving throws, we would do 128 damage per round total. And against enemies with plus five to their saving throws, it would be 111 DPR on average. And we're still just hanging out in the middle of the pack compared to other T1 builds. And again, I continue to be impressed by that fact. So... Final thoughts. Once I averaged the DPR for this build across all damage reports at all potential bonuses to enemy saving throw, this build comes in at a solid tier score of 65, meaning that it is firmly in the middle of tier one builds when compared to other sustained damage per round builds that I've done to date. Did I say that artificers were weak? 
<laughs> but okay, yes, oftentimes doing a lot of damage to multiple enemies is less tactically sound than doing even a little less overall damage, but focused all on one enemy, right? Action economy, focus firing, I get it. But like I've said, sometimes multi-target damage is really useful in a fight. There are very few D&D parties that I've been a part of where you didn't kind of want to have someone on your team that could throw out area of effect damage when you needed it. You know, there will be plenty of scenarios where you might soften up a couple of targets and then on the fighter barbarian's turn, they finish off one of them that you'd softened up with their attacks. And then on the rogue's turn, they finish off the other one with theirs, right? And so it could be a really great thing tactically, even when there aren't just a ton of enemies that you're gonna be blowing up with big area of effect damage. I just really love having this character who can do damage to multiple enemies every single round without having to spend a lot of resources in order to do it. Again, such a rare thing in D&D. And yeah, sure, sometimes you'll just be up against a single big bad, right? And those times might feel a little bit bad for you damage-wise. You know, let your single target allies really shine in those scenarios. And hey, you can potentially throw out your harder hitting single target spells in those scenarios if you wanted. And even change your cannon to provide support instead of being a flamethrower, right? Let it give temporary hit points to most, if not all of your allies every single turn as a bonus action. That's fantastic. And even, you know, for that matter, if you're teamed up with someone who's throwing out wall of fire or spike growth or cloud of daggers, again, change your cannon to something that does damage and pushes back as a bonus action, regardless of the enemy size without any saving throw. That's potentially really strong as well. And we really haven't even talked very much outside of a brief mention, the other things that your cannon can do and the versatility that that allows you just really gives a lot of depth and variety to how you could play this character. And that is what makes the artillerist the most attractive as a concept for me. So anyway, that is the build for the week. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed creating it. I love you madly. <laughs> Thanks so much for all of your support. Uh, please check out the other content on the channel if uh, you're not in the habit of doing so. Like, subscribe, do all the things that I'm supposed to tell you to do. But above all, I hope you have a fantastic day. I hope to see you again really soon. And until then, take care. Bye. We can create, we can create magic we can magically <laughs> chicho 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 I think Santa Claus is wrapping some presents back there not sure if that's getting picked up on the mic ah uh, don't do that no stop stop it stop it Monday Monday so good to me because it's an artillerist because and because it oh goodness and because <laughs> hmm. oh, you stretch whoa what is with the sweaty pits i'm not even hot right now i'm freezing my hands are cold they're icicles <laughs> That's disgusting. I'm sorry you had to see that. Here's what we're going to do as soon as I figure out how to say this phrase. Santa's getting noisy. Don't even say that because it's a moot point. Yeah. Deodorant's working anyway. <clears throat> Santa also apparently has a cough. Don't say that. That's... Make a freaking decision and stick with it. I think it is force damage, right? Better not be fire damage. That really would be the worst explosion ever. Come on, Santa. <laughs>